Hello and welcome to Lightways at Life Astrologer with me, Anna Isabel, and I'm so happy to welcome back Martin Moritz today. Hello, Martin. Hi there. Hi. Now, today you have joined me um, as a guest to discuss this wonderful book by Liz Green, um, Relationships and How to Survive Them. Uh, probably one of the best titles ever. Um, <laughs> but um, you were just telling me that um, you have long been a fan of Liz Green's books. Absolutely. So this is uh, a German copy. I do have the English copy as well, which for me is always like very, very helpful because if I had worked through a book in German and then read it again in English, I would have like... The right expressions for example because sometimes as a non-native speaker i would fumble i would say oh so what's the english expression so that's really helpful and also i have a pile of books astrology books which to my shame i haven't uh, read still and they're all piling up and looking at me making me feel guilty like read me read me read me but since i'm a tourist and to reinstate, like to do things again and again and again. I I find myself reading the books of Liz Green and how it's support us indeed again, 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 because they are so helpful. And I think that they should be in every astrologer's library. They should, really. Fundamental, I think, um, as you. Um... I have never had the the privilege of meeting Liz Green, but I actually consider her to be my teacher <laughs> because um, it's just the the foundation of my astrology is very rooted um, in her way of doing astrology and. It speaks to me, it has spoken to me from the first time I ever picked up one of her books. Um, and, well, it just makes, makes sense of people around me. Um, so it's, it's a very important aspect of learning astrology for me. And I do direct all of my students in, in that way. Yeah. So so whenever anybody asks me asks me for a recommendation, I would always recommend uh, Richard Eiderman, Howard Susportus, Liz Green, and I'm always like so honored being like a returning tutor for MISPA for John Green, and I studied at the CPA also, so I have a diploma and stuff. So I really really hold this school of astrology in in high esteem and uh, yeah so it's it's a good starting point and it's also a good returning point so i always find myself at coming back and, and back and back because you never tire to read certain books again and since i'm a couple therapist um, this is sometimes really helpful also for my own relationships but sometimes <laughs> it's it's shocking to find like the info in front of you like oh wow this is a really pardon my French fucked up composite for example so no wonder I'm having a miserable time with this and that person and also I mean I mean um, it's a bit like prognostics so you can do transits you can do solar return you can do secondary progression and also if you do partnership astrology so you look at the individual chart you look at the synastry and you look at the composite so you have like three angles to get the wider picture because from my experience it never does the trick to just choose one tool no, you, you need to have the um, the whole picture. And so um, I understand then that this particular book is not your first time reading it. No, I've no. read it five times. Yeah, and and the focus of this five times. <laughs> um, 
the focus of this um, is the composite chart. And I'm just going to read a, a, a quote from, I, I think right in the very beginning where uh, Liz Green says, explains exactly what a composite chart is. And it is the reason why I love composite charts. The composite chart is like an energy field which affects both people um, both people, and draw certain things out of each individual, as well as imposing its own dynamics on both. So it's, it's really important because it's, and the reason why we were saying it's good to, to not just do the synastry, to do the composite as well, is because this is not about the chemistry that involved in between the two people. That's what synastry is. It's not about, you know, why they're attracted to each other or where they might be repelled by each other. That's, that's sinistry. This is different. And she, she says, she, there's another quote, it's about interpreting the energy field that they generate between them. And I think that's, it's so crucial because there's the two individuals and there's the unit that they create as a couple. Yeah. And that's different from the two individuals. It's so really it's th that we're talking about this in the context of couple relationships, but this would be true for a business partnership, for yeah. a parent-child relationship, what whoever you are in relationship with. And I, I did a... I think it was a relationship seminar. I was a part of a relationship seminar last year. And to illustrate the point, I had the composite of me and Teddy, my dog, yeah. um, because that is quite significant, what, what that reveals as well. So it's it's really, I wanted to, to illustrate that point. This isn't just about romantic relationships. How do you see the composite? And in, in relation particularly to this description that Liz Green gives of them? Um, I was thinking about that and a word which comes and goes, or, you know, is aura, so that two people can exude a certain aura and this aura can, might not be felt by them, but by others. Because, for example, I have I have friends with whom I quarrel, and whom I love dearly at the same time. So some people really get under my skin. So I have a lot of Aries going on. So I can be touchy touchy, and then um, other people might get back to me and say, "Oh, you and your friend, you are so joyous, and you're giggling away all the time." And then I said, "Okay," and I could feel that and. Sometimes it's it's helpful. It's really helpful to get feedback from others because being in, entangled in relationships, in friendships or in work relationships even, we might get stuck at the hurdles, at the difficult energies while watching it over the time. And, you know, and this is also what what came up because when I, when I read this, I don't know, when I was 27 or so, it had all this of like, oh, this is destiny. And you have to surrender to the composite aura energy. And now, after all those years, I have a much more realistic view on relationships. And I think that so much boils down whether our expectations of what a relationship is supposed to be lift us up, give us meaning, la li la li la And all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, this is expecting too much. And you must judge every single person in your life from the viewpoint of what this person can bring into your life. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes we are more important to the other person than vice versa. And you might find that in the composite because and this is really mind blowing because this would be like the next steps in the book, for example. Like if you compare the single 
chance with a composite, you might get a trace of who will be, who will get like the better share of it, so to speak, and who would, you know, so uh, who would have like the upper hand and who would like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, everybody says we're a great couple, but you know, scratch the surface and you will just realize I'm doing the washing up. I take the garbage out, la, li, la, li, la. And that's like really makes it so complex. And being a couple therapist, I know that, for example, what couples bring to me in my sessions is only like half the ticket. You know? It's interesting you, you're talking about, you know, do the washing up and everything else, because I feel that many a relationship would be saved by having a cleaner come in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the number of times I have begged people to please hire a cleaner if they can afford to, because yeah. it's that stress of the everyday stuff, because we're living in a society where both parties go to work. And so this is really important. And in fact, I think there was um, a talk I once gave about sinistry, and I spent most of that focused on the sixth house, <laughs> sixth house stuff. Sure. Um, because if you can't agree on the third and the sixth house stuff, yeah. you're in trouble um, because you're going to have different expectations. This is where in synastry, the two really kind of need to, to have an understanding. Um, otherwise, you're going to drive each other. It's those little niggly everyday running of, of life things that undermine and weaken. So, so it's quite an important statement you've made, but it also makes me think about a, an important factor, which is that the composite may show us something very different to the sinistry, which is I think what you were saying when you said you have friends where people see your friendship in one light, but the the way that you feel is different from what is being shown by the composite. And I think, again, it's so important what you're saying about the fact that everyone has an important part to play in the relationship. So, so both parties are, are really important. And maybe it is a, a perspective issue where perhaps one is more appreciative of the presence of the other. Maybe there's that kind of imbalance um, until something happens. And then, oh my goodness, you know, uh, if only I had realized, I didn't realize how much I relied on this person for this, that, or the other. So there's, there is that. And then there is the, not so much the lack of appreciation, but the fact that it's weighted because one person is more practical than the other and does all the apparent hard work, but then maybe they're feeling hard done by and aren't appreciating that the other person is bringing the inspiration that drives them forwards together. So, so there, that the synastry can show that, but the composite can also show maybe the upside of the partnership um, as well. So, um, I really do like appreciation because that's a big part of therapy to make people a appreciate themselves and the partner as well and so many people just don't seem to get to the point where they can appreciate the energy of the composite because they are stuck in their sinistries so and this harks back on what you were just saying about the sixth house about the third house because so many people if they would just learn to solve their conflicts to find compromises and this is mind-blowing because in sweden children have um something in school which is called empathy 
so they would learn. So children would be taught to solve their disagreements. Like, okay, listen to him, listen to her. What did she just say? Blah, blah, blah. What's your impulse? Blah, 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 blah. And I think since in our Western society, it's all about training our ego. And on the other hand, uh, looking at other people of just like sources of narcissistic food. This is why we are often so disappointed because I'm I'm dealing a lot with disappointment in my own life as well as with, with clients, with friends, blah, blah, blah. And this is why I always think like, having a more realistic view on on my own capacity as well as what other people can bring into my life and the the composite if it's if it's a challenged one would reflect that if i go there it'll be a mixed bag anyway so it's not like peaches and cream it's like okay and we we are not necessarily only attracted by people who are easy peasy, but sometimes we really want drama. And of course that boils down to karma, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, it's the <laughs> it's that it's karma. There's also an element of projection. Mm-hmm. Um sure. where you know the attraction is the projection. Yeah. we're seeing something in the other person that needs to be brought out in us yeah. and and so that is the attraction but we don't know it and if we knew it we'd probably run a mile but hey um that's not the way it works so so in we go moths to the flame but there was something that you said there that i i just wanted to come back to and you were talking about ego and that made me think about perspective. And it reminded me of a study that I watched um, done a few years back where they were looking at conflicts between couples. And it's so often centered on issues around money and, you know, the, as, as we say, the everyday running of life and particularly what we call the drudgery you know, the, you know, the taking the bins out, as you mentioned, and everything else that goes along with keeping a house. Um, And what was interesting is that the bickering that went on all assumed, they all assumed that they were doing more than the other person. And what was actually done was a kind of motion in time study where all the tasks that each did were clocked. And in the majority of cases, they were each underestimating how much the other person did. And of course, the reason they were underestimating, and this is very, very common, is that when we are tired, we are struggling to do our bit and we want help because we feel overwhelmed except and then we get resentful that the other person isn't coming to rescue us from our feeling of overwhelm and not recognize that they can't because they're in a state of overwhelm too and that happens at an emotional level we're talking about it at a practical level but it happens at an emotional level too and that's when people begin are not really not listening to each other they stop listening because they just haven't got any space left emotionally for anybody else's drama, anybody else's feelings. So I think that that's really very important. How do you feel composites can help shed, do you feel that composites can help shed light on on this? Yes, of course. I mean, take for example, the moon which of course is enormously important because you would you would like scratch the surface and you know try to find out sort of like the needs so the needs of the relationship and will there be friction or will these people be able to feed each other or if that's not possible because this green 
always um, also uh, elaborated on squares. Like, okay, so a square is like an invite to, you know, two energies are struggling with each other and you have to be creative and make a third energy out of it, so to speak. So what she's referring to is basically find solution, find compromises, be creative. And I think that if people are really interested in each other, so you don't necessarily have to call it love, but friendship or interest in each other, or you would just really say that, um, I, I, I really want this person in my life. Or on the other hand, if you are forced, you know, a family member, or you work with somebody and you can't just say, okay, I'm quitting my job, so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's in your interest to make something good out of that relationship. And it's so frustrating for me as a therapist, if one party is more willing than the other, and you would sometimes feel with one person, this person has already shut down. I mean, like really hardened, and I'm working my ass off to make him or her be more more gentle, more forgiving. And that's really a tough job sometimes. So as soon as I have them in a more gentler, in a more forgiving, in a more needy state, if you will, where they're licking wounds, then I can work with them. But in a state of hardening, I don't forgive you. You have done this. Bah, 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 bah. That was, so the, the square would stop. And that's the and the problem is they are they have may well have got there because by the time you get to see them, so it's ready. almost <laughs> too late. And I, you know, how many clients have I had that have been trying so hard to rescue a relationship single-handed because the other party is either oblivious or unwilling to to shift in any way and then my clients say right that's it time for a divorce because I've gone down every avenue possible there is nothing else and the other party who has been ignoring the last 10 years it acts as though they were a victim and completely shocked that they could, this could ever possibly have crossed <laughs> their partner's mind because they didn't have a clue. How did they not have a clue? It's because they switched off and they did not want to, to get to that point. So it's very, it, it's the timing, isn't it? By the time we see people, it's, it's either in the nick of time <laughs> Or it's too late. Yes. That's because it, somebody has already made up their mind that they can't they can't handle it. They, they just can't, they don't have anything left. And that's the thing is when they get to that point of exhaustion where they've got nothing left to give. Also, I mean, one party might be more optimistic, might quite enjoy friction or the intensity, whereas the other party might find intensity disagreeable, not at ease with that. So you really have to work on the relationship that both parties can enjoy what the composite, as it were, could offer them. Because so my, my idea of looking at that is like, okay, so um our own charge with you know the seventh house with our moon with the ruler of the seventh house la 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 of course we are prone to expectations our own drama about projections then we meet people and then the sinistry kicks in in either way and if we surrender so to speak for lack of a better word if we commit ourselves then the composite might start to work its 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 aura, its 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 magic, if you will, because there is magic going on, and it's so tragic because sometimes, and it goes two ways. I mean, um, other people might not see the magic, and they would come from a party and say, "Oh my God, I met this couple, and they were at each other's throat all the time." But little did you know, these people might have 
great sex or enjoy quarrels. I don't know. And this is always like people are a fucking enigma. You 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 really have to take your time and try to 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 get into their shoes because most of the time it's not my idea of a happy relationship, but that's not my problem. I have to make the effort and try to decode what their idea would be and try to help them. And as soon as I found that out, that was a great job. <laughs> and, and again, that brings us back to the composite because yeah. as uh, Liz Green points out, it, it gives you the clues to the purpose of the coming together. What What is the point of this relationship what is you know what's in it for the two parties and and I think you know we're talking about it what's in it for the two parties but you know one of the things is that traditionally a marriage was seen as almost the property of the community yeah so it's not just about the two people coming together it was, it was something, it was a social event. It was a social event because this pairing was going to produce something for society. Now, in the most rudimentary sense, it would have been the children, of course. Yeah. But it's, it's a pair that's working as a unit, a unit which plays a part in society. And I think that's a really important aspect of the composite because the composite can actually very eloquently speak of what this pairing means for the world so that we as individuals have something to contribute, but together, we have something to contribute. And that actually was one of the, the interesting things about doing the composite with Teddy, my dog, because that was very clear that we have something together to bring to the world. And I, you know, when I saw that, it really, it surprised me to see it, even though I kind of already knew it, but it was just there explicit. And it really made me smile because I could see that. So it wasn't just about what I bring to him and what he brings to me. It was about what we together bring to others. And that that's a very important, it's actually probably my favorite thing about a composite is to see how a pairing can have something that's unique and special for the world. Yeah, I, I I absolutely see what you mean. Uh, for example, at at Norwalk, I met this really really funny funny uh, lady, and we hit it off like a house on fire. And then we realized so she, so I have a lot of um, Taurus going on, and she had the sun and moon, and and we both had, for example, Venus in Aries and only like one degree apart. So, so of course we had a conjunction in the symmetry, but of course in the composite, we had the same Venus, of course. And then we came up with, with this funny thing, okay, the two of us, we are Venusing, you know? And, and we really made each other happy and everybody else said, oh, the two of you, you must have, known each other for a life and he said no never heard of her never heard of him and, and that's and that's such a such a blessing and if you mix amongst other astrologers it's so helpful to have like an explanation like why we rub people maybe the wrong way and why we are instantly attracted to others because we can say oh okay we are venusing or we could say mm, Actually, I didn't like him very much. And then you Google his or her birth data and you say, oh, uh, um, he had his Saturn on my moon. No wonder I, I, I had low self-esteem among blah, blah, blah. So 
that's really helpful but um and that's the tragedy because more often than not we meet people and they won't be able to supply us with their birth time so we have to work with an untimed birth chart and then we can't do the composite exactly that that that's you know, a... you know the exact times wouldn't you agree so a little while ago, you were talking about this this feeling of, of fate, and there's a very interesting uh, quote here from, from Liz on that subject, subject, where she says, we can do nothing to change the fundamental patterns in the composite chart. And so what do you feel around that? I think you've already said, well, I didn't really like that. So exactly where are you now with this? Again, it has to do with being more realistic. And I have Neptune as part of the yard with my uh, Mercury. And I think you know my chart. And uh, Neptune is the ruler of the seventh house sitting at my IC. So even as a small child, I had really, really fantastic ideas of what other people are to bring into my life. So. I'm a bit of a fantasist and being confronted with other people all the time. I mean, I work with people, I am surrounded with a quite closely knit uh, circle of friends. And this, this element of disillusionment is painful, but it's so relaxing for me because I don't tend to expect unrealistic shit from other people anymore. I still do. And when I meet new people, of course, this projector kicks in and I'm zoor, zoor, and I was like, oh, I'm so, uh, uh, um, because at the end of the day, I'm someone who, who is quite easily impressed. So, you know, and then you said, oh, this is not good. You know yourself. And after the illusion always comes the disillusion. So brace yourself. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> I do. And, you know, having Virgo rising means you have Pisces on the descendants. So the tendency yeah. to uh, idealize the other um, can lead to some disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's a good thing because we weren't realistic in the first place. And having so much earth going on in my chart, I find it grounding to be more realistic about other people because they don't necessarily mean to hurt me it's just that it's not in their nature to supply me with something which i might not have acquired as a child because there is always like this void and this holds true for many many people so we all run about with our um, invisible voids and seeking filling and of course, <laughs> and then we bump into a wall and say, oh, I'm so disappointed. You're a bad person, you know. You say, mm, actually, after all these years, like, I don't think that's how life goes. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, and I think, you know, the for many people, particularly those who are more Neptunian in their nature, there is, you know, the falling in love with potential or, you know, and and I think one of the things that is very important to do is to understand that potential is not reality. Potential is potential. And so we can see the best in others but be mindful that they might not be there yet and may never be there and and be forgiving of that you know use that neptunian energy to be more forgiving and have the compassion because i think the the problem with i feel with neptune is that it is incredibly unforgiving um when the ideal is not met so, and I think Pisces, for all the reputation of being incredibly forgiving, is possibly one of the most unforgiving signs when it's disillusioned. When the fantasy is gone, it's, you know, it's very unforgiving and very unyielding and gets lost in kind of morbid grief process. 
that is very difficult or uh, I think inconsolable is the word. And and so this is this is about drowning in your sorrows. There's a great line from a song, a band called Police Dog Hogan. And, I, and I'm just trying to remember the exact line, but it's brilliant. And it's something along the lines of, you know, trying to drown your sorrows and finding that they've learned how to swim. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, and I, I love that line because it sums it all up, you know, this is what happens. Um, so we, we, we do need to be aware of that tendency to idealize as much as we need to be aware of the tendency to demonize too, because projection can go the other way. And, um, and it's the, and it's seeing the darkness in others. So if, if we might be, have the tendency to idealize others, it's the opposite. It's this, that projection and, and, and the demonization of, of others as well. It's the two extremes. I couldn't agree more. And touching on that is like, um, and this is what Liz Green also says. It's like, you can have a composite with anybody and you might not even get to meet this person in real life, but in your fantasy. And here is now the story because I was stalked by a student of mine for like a year and a half. And this lady had like, the fantasy that I was her best friend and that was getting like really intense and she had a strong so she was uh, a double Scorpio with Neptune rising and of course me with all my uh, Taurus planets in opposition like running into her seventh house so to speak and then forming this composite and I don't remember offhand but that looked pretty, pretty dramatic, that composite. And so I don't know about you, but sometimes when I have clients, I do the consultation chart. So, okay, uh, this person is coming to me, so I will be the ascendant, so I will be the receiving party, la 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 And that looked doomed. That looked really doomed. And after that, you know, it was tick, 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 tick. So long story short, we came to an agreement and I decided after all that I should rather be flattered than heard because I could be one to idolize other people and I might have spent years and years of my life of like dreaming of having like the perfect boyfriend or the perfect mentor or like there is somebody out there to rescue me. And I grew up very religiously. And I remember uh, talking to Jesus at night when I couldn't sleep. And I found that comforting because I said, nobody gets me, but Jesus would get me. And that was a comfort. And I can still feel why so many people might be religious or other people. I said, well, yeah, don't judge them because they might see a savior figure and that might be resourceful to them but as soon as we enter the arena of real life people boy are we in trouble wow you know uh, 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 don't do that you you you'll end up in trouble but then again that might be your lesson in love in in life in love and finding yourself because at the end of the day as 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 rupaul always says like um if you can't love yourself how the hell are you going to love anybody else and vice versa? Because sometimes I feel accepting love is just as difficult as giving love. Accepting love, in my experience of working with clients, it's much harder than giving love. Um, we, we work on this assumption that um, people um, are can't be loving if they don't love themselves. No, 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 no. It's the other way around. And where that's true is when we're talking about the concept of unconditional love. And we're back to idealism again. In order to, 
to be able to love unconditionally, it means that you cannot be looking for something back. And so that means that you can't be looking to the other to love you and behave towards you in exactly the same way. So very often where people are very loving and very uh, affectionate and very helpful to others, that is a form of love. It is not necessarily a form of unconditional love because they are doing it unconsciously most often in the hope that this is going to be reciprocated and that they they will be looked after in return. Um, and that then is where people become very bitter and disillusioned when that fails to happen, particularly when they've been putting so much into it for a number of years. And so it's much easier to, to love than to receive love at that level. But then unconditional love is another level again. And, and then, yes, the love for the self has to be in place. And, and I think it's that point at which people are very exhausted of, from giving that I tend to see them. <laughs> and it's like, well, where, where am I going wrong? And why am I always the one who is running ragged and exhausted and nobody ever does anything for me? Okay, well, yeah, let's look at that. What are you doing for yourself? Um, are you cooking for yourself? Are you actually taking care of yourself, you know, your own nutrition? Let's go back to the basics. You know, what does that, when they say, I don't even know what that looks like. I say, okay, well, let's look at the basics. Because if you are taking care of yourself, physically, that's an act of love for yourself. It means you care about yourself, you matter. And of course, they're all falling down on that point because they're too busy trying to get somebody else to do that for them. And I think that this is a, a very fundamental factor. So yes, we have to begin by taking care of ourselves. That is, that's what loving yourself looks like. You take care of yourself. It doesn't mean that you look in the mirror and you believe you're gorgeous. Um, but you look in the mirror and you think, you know, I like who I am. I like what I'm doing. I value myself. And that's I, the, it's the value. I, I um, always, so I always offer the following mantra. So before you go to bed and brush your teeth and stuff, and you look in, in the mirror and the mantra is, I am, a likable person i like myself and i can see why other people like me so i wouldn't even go as far as say love because in german it's a it's a cheesy word so we are using it more more you know <laughs> more more cautiously than in the english language but i always think that if you look in the mirror and are unforgiving and they said, oh, I failed today or why are people treating me like that? And this is it, oh my God. And you go to bed with this, oh, this really uncomfortable feeling of being in the world and this unconditional love. I, I mean, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. So to love yourself unconditionally would always fall back on, oh my God, I can't concentrate. Uh, I look like shit today, blah, 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 blah. So it's also like a cognitive thing because as one of the rules in therapy is don't believe everything you're thinking. So you have to break the patterns and you say, oh, these are really, really self-deprecating thoughts. So I'm trying to twist them, trying to twist them and then breaking down to be more at ease with myself. And all, all of a sudden, the whole game changes and then I'm much more, much nicer towards other people as well, right? And I think a composite can give us a hint of where I can find the gold, where I can find the gold. And also it can prove to me that I might be astray 
for example, if I'm very much in love with somebody who would not feel the same thing about me, but might be a good friend, then it's it's advisable to look at the um, at the composite, and we might find like a square to Jupiter, so it. Um, big expectations so you go hungry into a relationship or neptune or what have you and here's the funny thing again and this is where we where we kicked off also is to compare this the the individual charts with the composite it's such an eye opener wow this this is absolutely ingenious shit but for students sometimes to uh, to elaborate it so i always shy away from them because at, um, as soon and it's the same with the solar return and they would just uh, make a beeline at the solar return and uh, try to get too much information out of that and that holds true for the composites as well and i said well listen guys take a step back this is just one tool out of a toolbox, yeah? Because it's just, it's so captivating to say, here, I have proof, it's the composite. The two of us were meant together. We have a moon Venus in 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 uh, Taurus uh, at the ascendant line. Context. It's <laughs> context. Yeah. The composite has to be seen within the context of the two pieces that create it. And, you know, and I, in the same way that solar return has to be seen in the context of the individual's life, uh, et cetera, there's always a context for everything. But it's wonderful that um, we have had this opportunity to talk about composites um, in, in so much detail. And so for that, we thank Liz Green to, for giving us this wonderful point of discussion uh, through her brilliant book, Relationships and How to Survive Them. So thank you to Liz Green for her wonderful book. And thank you to you, Martin, for coming along to talk about it with me today. Pleasure, as always. <laughs> So I'm going to be putting a link to the book in the description box, but um, if people want to find you, Martin, um, how do they do that? So my full name is Martin Sebastian Moritz. So they can find me on YouTube. They could find me on Instagram. And my website is astro-via, so V-I-A, like life in, in Latin, Dot com, but if you Google Martin Sebastian Moritz, it will it will pop up. Anyway. But I'll be putting a link to to your website in the description box. Um, so thank you very very much, Martin, again for today. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for watching. Uh, next time we're going to stay with psychological astrology as we look at counseling and astrology. Until then, goodbye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>